Before we start the discussion, I would like to first introduce the panel members and invite them to the stage. We start with Richard. Richard is the Chief Executive Officer of UK India Business Council. And in his role, he works towards broadening the Council's activity and membership across the economic corridor to ensure UKIBC is a truly bilateral organization through policy advocacy. He's a leading advocate for a strong relationship and partnership between the UK and India across sectors, particularly encouraging UK firms to cooperate, co-develop, and make in India. A graduate from the University of Durham in history and Cambridge in industrial relations, Richard has been in the subcontinent for more than a decade. In addition, he's been living in India for more than two decades. So welcome, Richard. Thank you very much for taking time up. Two, two decades, I just mentioned that. <laughs> welcome, Richard. Thank you very much. I'll now welcome Shilpa. Shilpa is head public policy in Pernorica, India, and handles matters such as market access, Thank you. Sorry. Foreign trade, responsible drinking, consumer protection, and working on strategic initiatives for the alcohol sector and on policy issues. She has spearheaded several policy initiatives, both at central and state government level. She brings over 21 years of policy and professional advocacy experience and has worked very closely in the regulatory space. Some of the sectors she's worked in, food processing, retail, FMCG, luxury and consumer products, and also has been working in various committees along with trade association, else also working in the e-commerce policy, direct selling policy and consumer protection act. She's worked at Bharti Telecom and was instrumental in setting up the $1 billion dream project, Satya Bharti University. Thank you, Shilpa. Thank you for coming and spending time with us. I now welcome Sridhar. Sridhar Pungur is the Chief Operating Officer at John Distillers. And he has over 30 plus years, if not more, experience and works with John Distilleries in shaping the organization's overarching strategy. A graduate from Madras University, he has spent over 20 years in the, in the Alcobev sector, and prior to that, he was in senior leadership roles in media houses such as Times of India and the Z Network. A very interesting uh, <clears throat> area in which we can focus on when Sridhar, when we talk to Sridhar, is in the area of the fact that John Distilleries has been one of the pioneers in setting up uh, the single malt evolution in India. Today, John Distilleries distributes in over 48 countries and has got over 300 international awards for a single malt. Congratulations, Sridhar. So Sridhar spends most of his time in his role in identifying and instituting key, key strategic initiatives, not only to drive top line revenue, but also have a profound impact on bottom line profitability. We expect Sridhar to not only participate in the discussion, but also to give a lot of bites on how he sees the single malt sector evolving. I'd uh, like to request Sanjeev Vij, Vice President Corporate Affairs at Diageo India. <laughs> Sanjeev is another industry veteran, and he has spent over 30 years now, Sanjeev? Uh, he, that's right, but more importantly, we need to understand that Sanjeev also has spent a lot of time outside of the Elkobev sector, in the telecom sector, and he's always been working at public policy, advocacy, and also one of the key areas where he focuses on and which he's keen on is the ease of doing business in India, which is something which we're all looking forward to hearing about. Thank you, Sanjeev, for taking time and coming here. And then I would like to invite Gaurav, Gaurav Sisodia, 
who's vice president agri food and extractive industries in invest india gaurav holds an mba from the university of petroleum and energy studies and he leads the initiatives of investment promotion facilitation public policy strategic advisory to cxos for india market entry and expansion he has worked on multiple policies and initiatives of the central as well as state government a key area for us to strengthen the business ecosystem and drive growth in sectors including agriculture and allied where we fall in food processing where we fall in and energy so we got a very very strong panel here cutting across industry cutting across key enablers i see both richard and gorov to give their inputs on how their role in enabling the ecosystem to progress at a very fast pace uh before i start quick introduction about myself how can i forget about me <laughs> sorry my name is sanjeet uh, i am the ceo of the international spirits and wine association of india and i have over 40 years of experience in the alcohol space in this career which has spanned close to 40 years as i mentioned but it has spanned multiple roles and multiple companies i worked in india i worked in the uk south africa asia companies in which i uh, worked with are diageo united breweries sab mela heinz tomato ketchup and a company in delhi a uh, engineering company in delhi called as contractors um so i in my role um i'm i'm leading the association in its objective of putting the right things in place so as to build sustainability in our expansion in our business expansion and the ease of doing business and we look forward to having a great discussion and i also look forward to you all also interacting and helping this discussion become more meaningful and more incisive thank you hello okay so uh, just to help set the ball rolling i will put the context uh, in the right perspective so that we understand what are we discussing about the indian alcobef industry is one of the largest industries in the world i think as of the last count we are the fifth largest market in the world we sell over 390 million cases of branded spirits our excise revenue that means our contribution to the state excise is 3.4 lakh crores and in the last 5 years while the alcohol industry and this is because of covid and the impact of covid shows a cagr of around 2.6% the interesting part is that premium products showed double digit growth which very clearly indicates that premiumization is happening which means up trading of consumers is happening at a very large uh, to a very large extent the second uh, fact is that 5 years back the contribution of premium products was only 42% it's gone up to more than 50% of the total mix in this context some other facts and figures become very interesting exports have grown over 16% in the last year in volume and 20% in value which again is a clear indication that there is a shift in the product mix towards premium products imports in this sector have actually slowed down in the last year and and therefore there is a very interesting hypothesis which we need to build on is that if your exports are growing at a faster pace and imports are stagnant then there is a time in the near future we could see that we could well end up being a trade neutral or a trade surplus state which is extremely good news for the sector what i would like to uh, now do uh, focus on is the panel to discuss on 
the evolving, evolving Indian spirits industry, the global context, and also what do we need to make our industry more sustainable, uh, build in the right cues and interventions to ensure that we are on the growth path and a sustainable growth path. And also, how do we intervene in this market to make us compete in the global arena? So that's going to be the focus of the discussion. And I look forward uh, to all the panelists contributing to it. To start the discussion, I'm going to start with Sridhar. So as I said in the beginning when I introduced him, John Distillers are the pioneers, are amongst one of the first few who focused on building Indian malls, Indian single malls as we call them, as a key focus area. And today they are present in 48 countries and have won over 300 awards. And I think it's good for us, and we good for us to understand from Trigger. Uh, Sridhar, you know, what was the trigger? How did you get into this business? Yeah, interesting. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we, we started off as a small company in 1996. We started, John Dissius uh, established in 1996. Till 2008, we were more of a regional player, restricted to Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, Andhra, and Kerala. Maybe a bit of uh, Goa, we had a little bit of presence there. So my chairman, uh, whose name has been lent to the brand, Paul John, he is a, he's an avid traveler. He, been, he used to travel a lot. He was thinking that why not we look at Indian single malls as a subject rather than looking at you know going for economy brands only. We, we used to do only economy brands. So that was a, quite a challenge. In fact, uh, when the first discussion happened, we were laughing at him, saying that uh, we are selling a brand at an uh, economy brand at such a cheapest uh, price, and we are talking about uh, single malls. How are we going to do that? He said, there's a huge potential. Yes, fair enough. Then uh, he did travel, and then uh, we decided, let's say we will establish it in Goa, because Goa, I'll tell you the story why Goa we chose. So we said, OK, we'll start up in Goa. In 2008, we did the foundation <laughs> part of it there. In any other businesses, what happens is you can do the business in about three to four years' time. It's absolutely possible. But in single malls, your minimum requirement from the day you start your first stone laid to the uh, liquid being taken, it takes minimum six to seven years. That's the kind of incubation you have for this. So we were laughing at it. We are talking about six years down the line, we are going to sell a product, and we are going to start now. I mean, I'm not able to understand this business. Because I was in the media industry. Like, I mean, today I, I talk about advertising, and today I talk about reports, tomorrow it is published. <laughs> so suddenly we are talking about six years down the line. And even the bankers had a shock, actually. They said that we don't fund for more than five years. You're talking about six years, seven years, and nobody knows about the industry. Nobody, that industry was not booming. Thanks to uh, DIJO, they had a good presence. But beyond that, there was no single malls category as such. So this was quite interesting, and then we did do that. <laughs> In 2012, I had another shocker. My chairman came back and said, I'm not going to launch in India, I'm going to launch in UK. I said, this is like uh, having a bold step. I mean, uh, you're going to teach your UK about uh, the Scottish about the Scots? I mean, this is going to be really a challenge. He said, that's where it is. If we succeed there, then we can talk the story across. Otherwise, it's not going to be possible. So that was a great success for us. We launched in UK in 2012. And uh, another, after that, next three years, we went all over the uh, world, I mean, all over the globe. And in India, we launched in 2015. <coughs> the flagship brands were launched in 2015 in India. There and after that, the uh, story is there for all of us. So that's how the figure happened. <laughs> so, um, Sridhar, if you were to look at, you know, you, right, you gave us the journey from the time Paul talked about um, focusing on single malls. But what the things did you focus on to, to make this such a big success? Very interesting, uh, Sanjeev, because there are, there are a couple of points in this. One, in alcohol, there's always a perception, right? It, I mean, if you go back 10 or 20 years before, it is a price which determines the quality. If you say higher the price, higher the quality. So that was the perception which was there earlier. I'm talking about Indian context, right? I mean, I'm, I'm sure Sanjeev will be able to help me out uh, with a better answer on that. So that was the uh, point which was taken. Then we said that, okay, if you're talking about quality as a matter, then what are we going to do? Because single months is known, not known to us. So we, we need to have a master distiller in place, and we have to, we have got a trained master distiller with us. We send him all over the world. I said, okay, first two years, you go and study and come back. There's nothing you can do about it otherwise. 
So the quality was one of the most important factor. Then came the choice of barrels, which is the most important thing. What has happened? Actually, single malt is nothing but you take barley, you distill the barley, and you get it, right? The liquid is like water color. It's not the color and the ingredients, everything happens from the barrel. It extracts from the barrel. So you need to have quality barrels for this. If you don't have quality barrels, you don't, you're not going to sell the story. Again, the barrels is a different subject. I mean, none of us know about the subject. You got to go to US because you use only once, you, uh, I mean, you use bourbon barrels for this because that's where you get the extracts properly. You can't use Indian oak or any other oak. I mean, we used to go for once use barrels itself. So when we went for the barrel, that was another interesting part happened was uh, the distilleries, they discard almost about uh, 1 million barrels a year in US. And you are like, I mean, you, you're going to talk about asking them, can you give me 200 barrels or 400 barrels? That's what you're going to start with. So like, I mean, you were know, not even in the picture to be seen there. And, and the interesting story on barrels, you know, it takes to make uh, three barrels, you need to cut two oak trees which means these trees are grown for almost 80 years, right? That's the kind of thing. Of course, the U.S. has got a huge forestation and they keep, their sustainability is very good and they, they keep planting the trees quite often. That's, they do it to take care of this one. So when you go for selection of this barrel, they do a distillery run barrels. There are two types of barrel selection. One, you go to the uh, cooperages. The cooperages gives you barrels. Okay, he's got the selection. You can go and uh, take your barrels. He's not going to give you, he's not going to allow you to select the barrels. Then the other one is the distillery run. In the distillery one, there's again called something called A grade and B grade. So you've got to be very, very cautious. So we said it is worth investing money by making the person travel there and select the barrels, even if it's going to cost us. And that's how we started taking the barrels into account. Where we said, I, I, I used to remember, we used to go for 500 barrels and 600 barrels. Today we are talking about almost close to about 1 million, uh, not 100,000 barrels now with us. Wow. That's so, kind of so Sridhar, I think, I think you've touched a very important thing. So essentially saying one of the most important things which you focused on was not only quality, but ensuring that everything to ensure that quality you did it in a very focused manner. Absolutely. So that's one. But, if, but you know, producing a product you can with quality, the distribution, making the brand available is another important thing. How did you go about distributing it? I am going to talk about a lot of interesting theories actually. I hope you don't have to get bored about it. <laughs> You know, actually, when my chairman landed in uh, uh, in UK, so the visa officer was asking him, what are you here for? He said, I'm here to sell single malls. You mean to make, you're making India single malls and you're going to sell it to us? He was laughing at us. That was the story it started off with. So the question, it is it is not easy to sell our story. What helped us, I mean, I should, I should give credit to the first uh, mover who did a very good job is Amrut. They are the people who first launched, in, I think in 2010 they launched and they got the national award, I mean international award for the best uh, single, in, I think the best single, uh, single malt in the world. And that's how the entire start, thing started opening up. And we, got, we also started getting awards. And the awards made a lot of sense for us. The awards got a lot of recognition. It's been carried out, in fact, today's work in, in social media, everything, I published something today, it's the next half an hour, it is there with every, all of you. That's the kind of thing which has taken up so that really helped us to take it forward. And uh, the, the, the one is the selection of barrels and quality. Then I talked about the awards. These are two things which really married together and then we went ahead. Good. Uh, I understand now you're now in 48 countries? Yes. Okay, good. So what we'll do is we'll take a pause now. Sure. And move on to Shilpa. Yes. Okay. So um, many of you may not be aware of the fact that the Indian domestic industry predominantly is focused or actually congregated in what we call IMFL. So Indian made foreign liquor is the expansion of the word IMFL is almost 95% plus of the total market. So, it's, so if you look at 390 million cases and you take 95% of that, that's the size of the market. And the two predominant players are members of ISWAI, and we are lucky to have both of them here. One is Shilpa, who represents Ponorika, and Sanjeev, who represents Diageo. A fact, and I think if you have been reading the papers, India has now emerged, uh, Shilpa, correct me, as Ponorika's largest market in the world. So that's, that's, that's a big round of applause for us as a country. So that's the first uh, point. The second point, and I'm going to 
focus a little bit on this and Chirpa, please tell us. Just today I read an article which talks about how Pernodica is going to open one of the largest investments in the branded Alco web space with a state-of-the-art malt distillery plant which is going to be inaugurated on the 7th of October by, by them through Mr. I think Mr. Kadkari and Mr. Farnavis are inaugurating it. Now, there's a point we need to understand. Perno Ricard and Diageo are totally focused and while the name may be international, they are truly focused on make in India and made in India. So, you know, so that's one of the things I want to emphasize on. So Shilpa, can you tell us a little bit about Pernorica, your investments in India, your domestic market, and then once you're through with that, we'll talk about future plans. Well, thank you so much. You started with such a positive note for us. Uh, truly, India is an exceptional story for Pernorica. Uh, and uh, I mean, India is the top discussion in our boardrooms, rightly so, not just because of being the top market, but also the kind of investments that we are deeply uh, putting in in the country. One such investment is definitely Nagpur, Bitaburi, where uh, we are uh, bound to and committed to set up our first distillery, class of arts distillery uh, of malt. I mean, if I just talk about the impact in the Vidarbha region, where it will uh, soon you see it blooming, growing, uh, glowing, is, uh, is, is uh, more than 50,000, around 60,000 tons of barley to be procured every year. That means multiply it with a multiplier effect of the land hectare that has to undergo the barley production. That means 90,000 farmers impacted and commitment to doubling farmers' income, which our prime minister has, our commitment towards shouldering that responsibility. So I think uh, the company, Pernurika, is deeply invested. And Sanjeet, you rightly said, whatever we do in India, 97% of it is make in India, right? Uh, our brands, I mean, Royal Stag, Blender's Pride, I mean, they are honestly a household no name. Uh, and the kind of category push that we have. For aspiring India, you know, that is one strength I've observed as an outsider, as a consumer, and now as an employee also, is for every segment of our brand, uh, of brands, there is a product offering that Pernorica has. So with the growing India, which is increasing in its disposable income, aspiring for a better premium experience, there is already a positioning of a ladder up brand. So I think that's the laddering that we've done in domestic market that's really worked in our favor, created our space. Secondly is also the amalgamation of bringing global experience, the learnings from the globe to Indian uh, geographies. And then picking up Indian strength, whether it's the farmer, whether it's the climate of uh, Nasik, you know. Dindori, where our existing uh, facility is, it's a unique climate, right? So that marriage that once you create, and of course the nausea and the craftsmanship of the blend that you give uh, creates world-class products, and we are very proud of our products and uh, our efforts in the country. We are really hopeful also, Sanjeev, uh, that India, as you said, uh, the future is shining here. And uh, while I would say it's not about drinking more or asking consumers to drink more, it is to drink better. It is to drink uh, in uh, an experience, uh, creating a moderation experience. Uh, so I think it's conviviality. Uh, so our parent company is a French company, and we believe in the concept of conviviality, which is the human connection. Excellent, Shilpa, and, and I'll quickly hop across to Sanjeev. Sanjeev, uh, everybody knows Diageo and everybody knows their brands. They have got the most iconic brand global, globally, but uh, nobody or many few people may not be aware that they are also a very big Indian company with extremely strong portfolio. And again, 
I would say what 90%, 95% of that business in, in, is in IMFL. Uh, the most amazing thing which I realized is that, you know, a lot of us sitting outside will look at us and say, or look at the manufacturers and say, are you just producing brands? And many of us forget that there's a strong back end which is focused on building sustainability, working on social development projects, working on ensuring CSR programs, which are meant to have a larger impact on society. So when Shilpa talked about Nagpur, I think a lot of you will understand that in Vidarbha, this investment of close to what? 2,000 crores or 3,000 crores? 1,800. So close to 2,000 crores is going to have a multiplier effect in the economic development of that area. Downstream farmers who will now be given an opportunity to produce what I would call now a cash crop because they will get better result, uh, better remuneration and it's going to actually impact very positively in that area. And so that's something which this industry brings to the table. At the same time, and I look forward to Sanjeev uh, now telling us a little bit about Diageo and then focus on the sustainability uh, projects which he has done and then I'll switch back to Shilpa for her to talk about as well. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. So uh, I think uh, Sridhar spoke about pioneering the single mall. Shilpa spoke about her brands. But, but then the largest selling whiskey brand in the world, and, and, and you know, the largest selling whiskey brand in the world is an Indian brand. And it's a brand called Megawa Number One from USL or the Azure India. So I think we're very proud of that brand. It's not only sold in India, it's, it's exported to over 20 countries already. And, and so, so, yes, we are all talking about the, the growth that the single malls and the artisan crafts uh, is, is, is making in India. But as Sanjeev mentioned, a very, very important part of our portfolio <coughs> is the IMFF, uh, is the Indian made foreign liquor. And, and its exports, uh, we, we export Medan number one, we export Signature, we are exporting to over 35 countries already. Uh, so, so I think that's where I think the strength of the business lies. Uh, yes, uh, the Azure even now does a single mall, uh, which like Sandeep wants and has a, has, a, has a very big sustainability connect. Not only uh, is that uh, you know, Diageo being the largest scotch uh, producing company in the world, I mean, in Scotland, but uh, uh, is only known for single malls coming from Scotland. But now I think we've recently done a flag of the India, and, and we are selling Indian single mall to UK. So, so, so that's uh, that's a very proud moment for Diageo. Not only because uh, you know uh, we're selling it to UK. But it's, it's being made in, in temperatures like 36 degrees Celsius in the state of Rajasthan. Uh, in a distillery, in a mall distillery, uh, which, is, which is probably only one of its kind certification of AWS for water. Uh, we not only uh, have a huge certification which we have now retained for three years, uh, but <coughs> I think we are, like Shilpa said, we are procuring the six row barley from the local catchment from the farmers, and that's contributing to their sustainability. Uh, Godavan, as you would know, uh, is, is, the, is the Indian name for the great Indian buster. And uh, there, uh, when we launched this product, uh, great Indian buster uh, barely missed to become the national bird of India. Uh, it is the state bird of Rajasthan. Uh, when we launched Godavan, uh, there were, I think, less than 100 of them left in this, on this planet. So a part of the proceeds of the sale of Godavan goes in the conservation of the bird, where we have now with the Department of Forest or Government of Rajasthan, uh, we have about 150 acres uh, land, which where we are creating a very good habitat for the bird. Not only that, the local villagers, when they saw our work, they came and they handed us over 50 acres of their own land. And they said that you do this work because you're doing such a fantastic work here. So, so I think uh, that gives us a very big uh, proud moment. We have tied up with the Wildlife uh, Forest and Wildlife Institute of Dehradun, 
who have uh, erected a hatchery there. And then, uh, you know, we, we know from them that there is a positive impact on the count of the birds. We still can't uh, reveal the numbers because that's for the government to get the data. Uh, so, so I think that's something which is at the core of how the Azure builds its brands. Uh, water, uh, water sustainability, because that's one thing that we, we look at and, and regenerating, uh, regeneration of water into the whole system. I think that's at the core. Uh, we are uh, a company which is doing a lot of work on water uh, right now. Uh, carbon, I think that's another area where we work a lot. Uh, apart from that, I think uh, women empowerment is another area where uh, where Diageo is really focused. Uh, we not only you know look at how we can do. Uh, we we have almost about 27 percent uh, diversity ratio in our company. Uh, our leadership team is 50 percent women. Uh, but I think it's not only about our company. Uh, we also own a cricket team and and. And we, we own a women's cricket team in IPL. So, so I think we are very proud of that team. It, it won the uh, women's uh, Premier League last year. And we are very proud of those champions. Uh, you know. uh, then uh, comes to skilling. Uh, we, we've got a Diageo Bar Academy. We have trained almost 12,000 plus people through that Bar Academy to work in various f &B jobs in the country. Uh, we have also tried to train another 5,000 plus people in the hospitality sector. Uh, we are also working with the with the center for people with the uh, skilling center for people with disabilities. Uh, so, so I think that's a very very uh, core thing at our heart. And you know, we are trying to rehabilitate people with disabilities. How to skill them and then how to employ them in the hospitality sector. So, so I think these are some of the uh, areas apart from the products that we sell worldwide is, and, and this is something which we really are very proud of. Excellent. Thanks, Sanjeev. I think um, we've set the context quite well uh, in order to take this discussion forward that in Make in India, Made in India already existed. All our members are predominantly producing Indian made foreign liquor. And there already exists a sizable export business. And I would like Shilpa to talk a little bit about their export business and you, Sanjeev, along with you in that order. Because let's try to give uh, and now move our, ourselves away from the domestic market. The context has been set. How has exports evolved for your company? Absolutely. I think, uh, as I said, I'm very, very hopeful, excited about the journey that the company is seeing. Uh, last seven years, our uh, footprints have doubled up, right? We are now present in 55 countries. So uh, the, the kind of brands that we are uh, sending is not just limited to the Gulf countries. They're, these are unique new markets like Mozambique, the Angolas, you know. The, the experience that the brand offers is now traveling the globe. I think that's the good story of how we are exporting a made in India product. And, uh, and uh, of course, we are very, very proud about it. Let me also talk about our Indian single malt story, which is L77, Longitude 77. Uh, if you look at the bottle, uh, the, the, the label itself, there is a longitude and a map of India. The, that's the longitude which travels from north to south, capturing the essence of what we want to say, that we are Indians, we are in your market, and we are competing with the global brands. And this is actually high class quality. This is a perfect blend. I mean, it's extra exclusively aged in American bourbon uh, casks and barrels. And uh, the flavor, as you said, Sridhar, I mean, I can only host you to taste it. <laughs> Today. <laughs> yeah, well, so, she, she, she will invite you. But I, I will. I will. We have a stall. Uh, we have our stall. Shekhar, can you help us with the stall? Where do we have? Uh, Hall number four, please, I invite all of you, please visit us, see and experience our products. Thank you. Thank you, Shilpa. Uh, Sanjeev? 
Uh, you know, I started my career in what is now DIGO in two avatars. First, when it was <coughs> various companies under Mr. Malia, and then in DIGO, when it took over. And in those days, uh, exports used to be quite interesting. We used to export predominantly to the Gulf. And like she said, there are now what, 50 plus countries. Yes. So I'm sure you had a similar story. Yep, uh, uh, absolutely, Sanjeet. Uh, we are a three-star export house, uh, exporting to about 35 countries now. Uh, like I said, uh, uh, the the IMFL portfolio is what we focus on. McDonald number one, the 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 highest selling whiskey in the world, is, is one of the flagship uh, brands that gets exported, uh, along with Signature, uh, even Black Dog, the bottled in India such. Uh, but I think uh, off late, uh, what we have added to the portfolio is Godavan, which is now getting exported to six countries, including US, Australia, New Zealand, UK, I mentioned about, and UAE, and, uh, um, and UAE. Uh, and, and I think uh, that's where I think uh, we are uh, showcasing the, the Indian craft, uh, because Godavan is something which is, which is very much made with Indian ingredients. And, and, and the Indian craftsmanship. And, and Sridhar mentioned about awards. Uh, it's already won about 65 international awards, including the, the best spirit at the London Distillers Award, uh, fun, this thing. So, so I think we're very proud of the product. Uh, the awards, as uh, Sridhar said, is the recognition. <coughs> so, so I think it's, it's really something that, uh, you know, Diageo is now very, very proud of. And, and it's, it's the Agio Global, which is now very proud of Kudavan. It's not only about the Agio India. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, Sridhar, I think we talked about your presence in 45 different countries. Quick, <coughs> quick one on how, how do you see that uh, evolving and going forward? And then we'll cut back into the chase. Yeah. Uh, today, what is happening, the brand recognition is there. There is no problem with the brand recognition. But at the same time, you have too many brands available. In fact, if you step out of India, you have a lot more. You have Japanese, you have Irish, you have Taiwanese, you have uh, Bourbon, you have every uh, single monster. There. You have, of course, the Scottish. I mean, we have both uh, Shilpa and uh, Sanjeev. Their brands are much, much powerful they have. But the question what happens is, how do we promote it is most important, actually. The biggest challenge, in fact, I'm, I'm just jumping a question before. <laughs> Uh, the biggest challenge has become the uh, promoting these brands internationally. What are we going to do for that? That's the that's the biggest. Today, uh, if I go, if I'm going to talk about like Shilpa was saying that, please come to our stall, you experience the product, then you learn about it. That's the only option we all have. Unless you people taste it, you will not know about the brand, right? But again, how many people I'll be able to do the tasting with? So this is where the biggest challenge lies for us. I mean, otherwise it would have been a fantastic. Uh, 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 absolutely, I think you have hit one key intervention required in going forward and we'll deal with it when we come to that sure. section. Thank you. So now let's, we've now established India and, and the Indian business ethos, the investment by companies like Diageo, Perno, etc. Now let's hear from Richard. What is your perspective about India looking from outside? And you've got 10, 10 years with UK IBC and 20 years in India. Brilliant. Um, thank you, Sanjit. And um, can I just say how honoured I am to be here? It's lovely, um, both as the CEO of UKIBC and also as an avid, enthusiastic consumer of Indian spirits. Um, I um, just a little co little context, just so we understand. So UKIBC is a membership-based um, private nonprofit, and we exist to help boost trade, investment, and technology collaboration between the two countries. Um, I have um, about 100 members, but collectively they've got $600 billion worth of global revenue and employ 3.5 million people worldwide. So it's quite a large, large survey sample there. Um, how is India perceived from outside? Well, I think there's two ways of looking at this. Generally speaking, I think the perception is changing. Um, I don't think it's changing fast enough, but it is changing. And organisations like mine and, and, and me personally spend a lot of our time back in the UK making sure that our clients understand that you know, India has changed dramatically in the last, not just the last 10 years, but the last two years. 
Um, and I think it's the most exciting economic story in the world. And I often uh, talk to clients back in the UK and tell them that we are midway through the Indian decade and we're at the start of the Indian century, and they have to be here. Practically speaking, that means um, that our clients here, our members, and also others from the UK are looking at India not just as a market, they're looking at it as a strategic partner. They're looking at it as part of their supply chain, part of their technology chain, part of their talent chain, part of their R&D chain. And we're very, very encouraging of that. Um, I think from a distance, to be fair and balanced, it's still a market that's perceived to have some element of operating challenge within it. But we all know that is changing very fast as well. Um, in terms of uh, spirits, um, clearly it's having a global impact. I mean, look at the, look at the other panelists here and the stories they have. I mean, the wonderful story about Gautavan, Sridhar's amazing success exporting and the awards internationally. And I suppose I'd just pick up on one thing, which is to say that I, you know, I think it's really encouraging that the work that Diageo and Perno and, and other of our members like, like Santori are doing um, is, is actually creating employment in India, it's investing in India, it's, it's allowing farmers downstream to have income from all that input. Um, so, um, yeah, I think the perception of India globally is changing very fast. I think it's got some way to go, uh, and we are here to help that happen. Excellent. Uh, so now, uh, one of the things that we all are talking about is in a way to establish this is the make and India story. And how do you believe that can be accelerated? And what do you think would be the key inputs to do? Yeah, so um, I, th I think the first thing to say is it's really, it, it's important to understand that from my perspective, from UK companies are very much making in India. They are investing That's in it. India. I mean, we have 615 companies in the UK, from the UK and India, $50 billion uh, of annual revenue. It's a, it's a top five investor in this country. So it's happening, right? But the success of make in India, I think, depends on a range of variables and those things acting sort of cohesively. So I'm talking about uh, incentives for more FDI, policy reform, infrastructure upgrades, um, skilled labor, and obviously integration into a global economy. And that last point's really, really important, I think, because we're not, we're not just talking here about um, exporting, we're talking about importing, right? So, you know, materials, uh, we talked about the Scotch whiskey that comes in for uh, IMFL. That's critical to India's manufacturing success. Um, so it's really important that, 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 uh, that uh, costs of importing are kept low and competitive. Um, that means reducing duties. It means simplifying custom procedures. It means aligning standards. Um, because, of course, if the input costs are low, then the exporting margins are going to be higher as well, right? Um, I think a final thought about Make in India, which is it's not just about business success in this country. It's about, uh, at its heart, it's about prosperity for people and the health of this planet as well and you know, you've got great examples here about UK companies which are doing a lot in India to, to help support India's SDG ambitions um, and, and, and you know UK companies are really leaning in that and they're very supportive of it. Thanks, thanks Richard. Uh, it, it feels like uh, Um, well, I mean, look, in terms of sort of ease of doing business in this country, um, we, do a, we do an annual survey of our members to ask them very direct questions about what they think of the operating environment. We've done it for about 10 years. Every year the metrics improve. Um, we, we, we ask them very direct questions about things like self-reliant India, and actually the majority of those companies tell us that they're supportive of it, which tells me that they're not just looking at this place as a market, they're looking at it as a manufacturing hub as well. Um, we, we're really encouraging, it's two sides this, we're really encouraging the UK companies to, to engage with India in a collaborative spirit, to really lean in on making in India and self-reliant India. My um, very, very brilliant colleague over here, she, she actually went to the, well, she dialed in to the UK House of Parliament recently and she told the parliamentarians in the UK, this, this, uh, you know, 
this in her submission to, uh, to the Parliament. Um, but I think the progress here has been absolutely amazing. I mean, Shubi was talking to me the other day about Carnetica, which I believe, like, you know, 36,000 crore of state revenue contribution from Alco Bev, and now they have 40 different manufacturing units, which must make it a huge concentration of states in India. Um, so clearly there's been enormous progress, both at the central and the state level in terms of ease and doing business. And, and you know, we're going to keep working very closely with both state and union, um, central governments to, to keep pushing them. Excellent. Uh, we'll now move to <coughs> Gaurav. Gaurav will speak on behalf of Invest India. Now, a lot of us think of Invest India as an enabler to encourage investment from outside the country to in, into India. And I think along with what Richard and all are doing, they can play a critical part. So, Gaurav, just help us understand a little bit on, on how do you see Invest India uh, work in this context? Thank you, Sajjit So, uh, as Invest India, we are the National Investment Promotion and Facilitation Agency of the Government of India under the Ministry of Commerce and Industry. And uh, as everyone talked here about Make in India, we are the operational arm for Make in India initiative. While we were operationalized in 2015, the key mandate that was given to us was to work with foreign companies to help uh, execute their Indian investment plans, ensure that they don't fa face any kind of issues, and do policy advocacy on their behalf. But with time, we see a, we, uh, our mandate has further expanded to working with domestic investors as well. So as the part of our job, we wear two hats. One is the investment promotion where we reach out to companies, help them understand the India market, help them understand the opportunities that the India market provides and pitch them for further investments in India. And the second part, which is investment facilitation, which is when a company is trying to evaluate the Indian market, help them understand what is the market opportunity, help them understand which are the states they could look at, help them, uh, you know, advise them on various policies, schemes, incentives and regulations. To the execution part, where you know a company has already made up its mind, okay, I want to invest, helping them with approvals, clearances, helping them acquire land, connecting them to various stakeholders, including any companies or the or industry partners, to governments, be it the central government departments or the state government, expediting their approvals, clearances, and land equations, to also making sure making sure that companies who've invested in India operate efficiently. So we do a lot of policy advocacy on behalf of the industry to the central government departments as well as the state government departments. We also work with the government for creation of various policies and schemes such as the production linked incentive schemes or you know any other schemes that the government sold out. So based on the need of the industry and the representation from the industry that we receive, we work with the industry as well as the government to roll out such new initiatives and schemes. So that's a brief about what we do. And apart from this, uh, Apart from the Maker India vertical, we also have a vertical which is called Startup India. So we are also the operational for the Startup India initiative. Under this umbrella, uh, we are trying to create a favorable business ecosystem for startups, helping them navigate through the complex market challenges, helping them connect with you know, investors and companies, uh, providing them proper incubation support and all of that. We, ro we also realize that for doing all of this and also facilitating investments in the country, you know, uh, all we need to work on a system where all the approvals and clearances should be smooth. So we are also implementing the national single window system under which we are trying to digitize all the central government approvals and the state government approvals on a single platform. For most of the sectors, it has been done, but uh, you know, Elkoba has been one sector which uh, we've still not been able to integrate. <laughs> yes. Yes. I so led I would, you into a trap, uh, Dora. <laughs> so <I> would, <laughs> you walked beautifully into it. So I would, Absolutely. So, okay. I would tell you this in advance. <laughs> so that, is, that has been one sector that has yet not been integrated in, onto NSWS. Uh, there have been discussions which have been going on with some states, but it has to be, you know, finally a decision that the states will also have to, the states will have to take because alcohol is a state subject. So, you know, depending on when some states come to that conclusion, maybe we could in some in the near future we could try to do some pilot with a state for doing that on that portal. Yes, yes, Gaurav. I think uh, let's 
Let's take a break. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. No, I think uh, apart from you know thanking God of, uh, for himself saying about it, I think what what is very important for us here to understand is that actually India for the alcohol industry is not a single country. It's a amalgamation of diverse policy making states. And because the states control uh, <coughs> alcohol and all activities around alcohol, we navigate between different policies in different states. We are probably uh, the most regulated industry in the country. Now, whilst I say the word regulated, we are actually not regarded as an industry. And I'm, I'm putting blunt, uh, bluntly points for us to look at. So therefore, we see as a group, and I'm not speaking as Sanjit Party as a group, key bodies like Invest India can play a wonderful role in balancing a state's desire to maximize revenue, which we have nothing against, but at the same time, allowing themselves to help the industry operate in a better manner in their state. Uh, so I look forward to the industry working with Invest India and trying to tell the states that whilst you may be a very attractive investment decision, uh, the fact of the matter is you on these three, four parameters, we can, and we need to work together. It's not prescriptive, it's indicative. So that's very important for us. And just to give you an example, and there's a state which is the l second largest state in the country, very fantastic industrial policy, but for alcohol, it's a closed state. I'll not name the state. People here will understand the state. <laughs> okay? The disparity in our business is phenomenal. In Gurgaon, a price of bottle is 100. By the time you go to Kerala, it's 300. Not because it's traveled so much. <laughs> it's because the Kerala government does not view. The fact, again, is India is changing. We are evolving from a country of joint families with very rigid ideas. We're now becoming nuclear. We're getting a very young population. I looked at a number, somebody said we had 20 million, 20 million? LDA. LDA every year. That's the amount of consumers who are coming into this space. They are much better educated than we were. Their attitude and their perceptions about alcohol as a social drink is very different from our generation. And therefore, there is a evolving Indian consumer. And that probably led to a lot of premium brands and acceptance of brands. What was something I could afford? My son probably drinks double the price of that as his entry pack. And I'm not joking. I'm talking about vodka, I used to drink say Smirnoff. Today, it's not Smirnoff. They, they go into the next level and very easily. They've got more money to spend, the propensity to spend money is very high. The moment we all, as a group, recognize that, and whether it is the state or the center, and we work together, we can create an ecosystem which is sustainable from a long-term perspective. Milking an industry for extraction of revenue will last a certain point in time, after which the industry starts amateur. <coughs> and we have seen it in our country. So I see uh, Gaurav, uh, us and you together, and I'm looking forward to engagement with you to help create that ecosystem. Uh, and we can do it, and I think it's good for our country, good for the Make in India Bill. So that's one part of it. I think another important factor is that, and now we are moving into exports, uh, because I think that's uh, something which we all want to uh, do, and do it in a very structured, cohesive, sustainable way. We all need to understand that a healthy domestic business is the platform to allow companies to be able to go global. If you have a problem back home, then your ability to go and compete in the exports market is severely impacted. So, so that's something which we need to all focus on. And that's why we spend a little bit of time on the domestic market. Now, my question to the panel, and uh, can, we can start off by saying, 
I recently saw again an article which says that the government of India or the sector is looking at touching a billion dollar target in exports. Whilst we will not look into whether it is achievable or not, I think we all need to understand what are the things we can do from an inclusive policy making perspective which will help at least our journey become faster and the pace of growth will become faster. So, um, Sanjeev, why don't you just kickstart this discussion that if we have to grow and grow at a much faster pace, what do we need to do to boost exports? Well, uh, Sanjeev, uh, very simply foster the environment. Uh, number one, prioritize innovation. Because innovation is what is going to, you know, uh, bring the Indian craftsmanship in the global domain. Uh, number two, uh, I would say enable ease of doing business. You said about it, but but I think uh, without ease of doing business, uh, to think that we can, we can we can reach an enormous target that we have in front of us, uh, because uh, uh, you know uh, you spoke about regulation of this industry. Uh, this industry probably is being regulated not only very heavily, but it is being regulated by laws which were made uh, almost about a century back, or maybe more. Uh, those laws uh, or those acts through which the the, the regulation happens uh, are are primitive. Uh, they're not. Uh, they need to be modernized, and they need to be uh, given the current context. Uh, very clearly, uh, the people uh, who are regulating the industry uh, from an exports perspective should look at the customer and the consumer there, rather than uh, today what we see is they are still looking at it within as to what if I today approve, say, this label, how is it going to impact the business in my state? Not looking at the interest of the customer, not looking at the interest of the consumer. So I think that lens needs to change. Uh, that's what is going to going to provide the right ecosystem, I would say, uh, for exports. Uh, we will have, as long as uh, alcohol will be a state subject, uh, I think uh, uh, Gaurav said that, but I think we will have to live with that reality. But uh, in a state excise policy, we all know state, we are all very familiar with state excise policies. And this is what I, I said in another platform to, to the additional secretary of commerce and the chairman APIDA, that there are sections of country liquor, IMFL, imported foreign liquor in an excise policy. There should be a section on exports. exports. Not only there should be a section on exports, uh, you spoke, uh, Gaurav, about the single window. I think exports policy gives us a very big opportunity to create the first single window for the uh, Alcobev sector Excellent. and I have a single export policy. Why should I need to go to 29 states or 30 states that allow alcohol or maybe if I am manufacturing in say four states, uh, we will not manufacture for exports in all the states. But I should have a single window where I give a label, it gets approved and then I go and I have 37 plants. I should have the flexibility of manufacturing at any one of those plants for exports. So, so I think that's the kind of flexibility uh, if the industry is, is, is accorded. Uh, I think that is what is going to give the right push. Uh, I mean, my view is, is on those points. Uh, there are a lot of other micro points which we can, as we progress yes. further, we can sort it out. But I think broadly, these are the areas which need to be focused upon. Yes, but let's stop for a second here, um, Sanjeev, because you raised a very important thing. I think states um, are extremely guarded or want to protect the rights over alcohol as far as taxation, control, consumption is concerned. Um, and, and again, here we see us as an industry body, along with the government of India, creating the Alcobev export policy, which not only focuses on the ease of doing business, but standardization of packaging, for example. You mentioned something which is so trivial, a label. 
but the laws of labeling in states vary some people want you to deface the label with their logos or legends uh, and, and therefore when it goes to a consumer in the uk and when he looks at the label and he finds legends on the top saying for sale in so and so state only it it actually is not presenting your product packaging formats internationally they do 70 ca they do 1.5 and and so packaging formats are again very important so yes i think we need to now look and work with the government of india that there is a need to create an export policy point number 1 Point number two, I think a lot of costs are put on to production on a production basis on both exports and on domestic sales in the same way, whereas the product is actually not consumed in the state. So there is a need for understanding levies, taxation, and rationalization of the same. So that's the second. Third is, uh, as you said, uh, just sheer procedures and processes. Customs, customs processes, etc., need to be focused on. So yes, there is a need uh, for us to have our export policy standards. We need to create standards, and I think um, you are the expert. Can you just give a two bits on standards, please? Yeah. Uh, so so basically, uh, you know, we we do have definitions now, thanks to FSSAI. Uh, for various products like whiskey, brandy, and everything. Uh, I think 50%, uh, my colleague from regulatory is sitting in, in the audience, and I was talking to him about an hour back. I think 50% of the state excise don't recognize that. They still want you to follow the BIS definition, not this. Not only that, I think uh, if, if that's the state of affairs internally, I think we need to, we need to do some agreements. I mean, we need to have this recognition. We need to recognize our standards that have been fixed by FSSAI. And this have been done under consultation with the industry. And, and, and these need to be then discussed with these 50, 70, 100 countries. That these are the Indian standards, whether it is on maturation, whether it is on, on, on any definition. other definition. Okay. And, and this is what we as India talk about when we talk about a whiskey standard or a this maturation standard. And, and then once we have done that, I think there will be those mutual recognitions. And, and we will find then that the acceptability of the products in more and more countries are going to increase. Thanks. Uh, Sridhar, you'd like to add anything? Yeah, yeah, sure. I completely agree with what you said and uh, Sanjeev said. Uh, one of the biggest problems we have is with multiple states and multiple label registrations, and these registrations are done every year. The kind of packaging material getting wasted, not many people know about it. The kind mm. of money we spend on that, there's something called MOQ, minimum order quantity, right? When you talk about minimum order quantity, you're talking about 100 labels being, if, you're, if there's a, a luxury product you want to launch, and that product is going to have 100 labels, and you need to, you have minimum order quantity is 3,000 labels, 2,900 labels are getting destroyed. Forget about companies' profitability or forget about anything else. Look at the sustainability part of it, the kind of things we are losing. That's very, very uh, critical here. And again, the state policies, he was explaining very clearly about the state policies, each state talking about different things. One state will say you have to, you cannot cross 42.8% of alcohol strength. One state will say that 50% uh, is allowed. And uh, see, the quality matters, you know, the, 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 the master distiller's job is to bring in classic quality, right? He, he is like an artist. He knows how to talk about it. When, he, when you give that kind of a facility to him, he would like to explore. Now imagine I'm going to put, a, I'm going to put restriction to him saying that you have to do this, you have to, then I can work on an Excel sheet mm -hmm. rather than working with him on this. That's the kind of a situation we are in. There is a, there's a lot of difference between the state laws and the federal laws in India. Federal laws are more supportive, far more approachable. In fact, I want to take a point here. If you look at the export incentives and the export facilities, what has been given is far, far superior compared to anything else. And when I was asking my CFO tomorrow, I have a meeting there. Is there anything I should talk about? He said, you don't have anything to talk about it. <laughs> the reason, no. one of, let, me, let me explain one of the main points. Let's say GST. Uh, we are not, alcohol is not in GST, right? We are not part of GST. But we pay GST and all the, pro, uh, or all the packaging, packaging we take. Okay, fair enough. Understood. That's a government policy. Fair enough. But in exports, they give us the last pie. We get the credit benefit, even though it is not part of GST. That's the kind of federal support we get. The duty drawback system is fantastic. 
So there are a lot of benefits we get as for the federal side is that under the states get united. Maybe Mr. Gauro can help us out in getting this to be together as one yes. one force. That will be class for all of us. That's something which will be really valid. The also, also uh, Sorry. I'll just yes, add sir. one more yeah. thing here is that I think uh, the state regulators uh, have to and, and I, I agree with Sridhar that this is where the federal government has an important role to play, have to be uh, nudged and pushed to broaden their thinking when it comes to IMF or the Indian products. You can import a 46% spirit and register anywhere in any state in India. But most states Can't do not this. allow a 46% Indian spirit to be manufactured. Globally, when you talk about single malts, 46% is the standard. Is, is the standard. I, I just support one minute, I'll just take. Why 46%, why 42.8%? Let's understand that particular point. The chill filtration process happens at 42.8% and below 42%. Whereas above 46%, you get, you, it's a, you get the natural proteins coming into the liquid. Right? You start enjoying the liquid there. So that's where the difference is. Now, we try to go and explain to the authorities. I do not want to talk about it. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think, no, uh, I, uh, let's just, you know, pause for a minute. I think I've been 40 years in this business. Um, Sridhar, Sanjeev, Shilpa, all of you have had various... Things are changing. Uh, but I think it's changing by us all going and talking to them from a perspective which is maybe short term. I think the, the, the states will have to start getting involved with us as a body, as a forum, Invest India. Uh, Richard can also think of ways and means. Because states are very interested, state, states are very interested in getting investment from abroad. They, and I think one of the key things which need to be told them that here we are trying to tell you that you can also evolve as a good industrial destination if you have the following things in place. Be that, uh, what we call is what we do. That, that needs to be ingrained into the mind of the states and the <coughs> regulators. Um, and therefore, there is an opportunity there. What is the perception of this group, uh, the panel, <coughs> on GI? Is there an opportunity there? Is there an opportunity for us to create a GI called Indian Malt Whisk, for example, Indian Craft Chin? Yes, sir. I'll take that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I, I saw the gentleman very excited, and rightly so. Uh, but yeah, uh, GI particularly, I mean, works phenomenally got of, uh, for across sectors. But for our sector, the issue is if you want to do a Feni GI, for example, or a Mahua, or you want to do a GI, What's the problem? How will they scale it up? The scaling will come when you have a partnership or a promotion done together with either an established brand or with the government supporting the brand. Now, in both the cases, as we heard our uh, fellow colleagues, the state does not give us price increase. Let's talk about that. We do not get inflation price increase. We are not FMCG. We are not beverages. We are alcohol. So if ingredients are uh, you know, touching the sky, the prices are rocketing of our input, but our output is decided by the excise commissioner. Sorry to say that. <coughs> so that's the checks. And then who will put hand in taking up Something and making it a GI. Yes. No, I think you so raise a very I think interesting uh, that's the gap. But GI in wine, if I say, works phenomenally for European countries. Can work for us. EU FTA is around the corner. This is a beautiful way. There is a chap chapter in EU specifically on GI. I think UK also we have a discussion on uh, GI particularly in a free trade agreement. But India is still not there to my mind. Because one, we don't have that offering of products. Two, that scale of offering also needs to be developed. Thanks. Thanks. I can just add a few points and also to the previous discussion. So yes, I completely agree what, what happens in states and 
to the excise departments. If you look at you know investments being promoted in states, it's majorly being driven by the industries departments. Whereas alcohol sector comes with the excise department, revenue department, and that's why I think there's also a difference in the expectations and you know modus operandi of both the departments at all the states. The central government's interventions have not been that much in that state. In fact, you know, frankly speaking, even we have not focused that much on alcohol sector very till very recently this year. Whereas oh, this sector has very much potential, we should start looking at it, and that's why we have worked with the Ministry of Food Processing as well. because there was also at the central government level no central ministry looking at this subject so with the ministry of food processing we've set up this uh, uh, advisory committee for alcohol sector i think in the first meeting all of you were also there at least we've taken some baby steps to ensure that somebody listens to the industry at the central level and tries to do some policy advocacy to the states as well after that meeting and meeting with apida as well there was another meeting which was done with us uh, with one state excise commissioner and we try to do such multiple meetings with the other states as well uh, some recommendations at least for exports uh, were agreed by the state that the state could look at we need to work with them on the next steps and finalization of those uh, coming to the gi part uh, there have been some representation that we have also got from some companies for example for uh, the gi tag for mahua and all of them so we had discussions with uh, trifed with the pida on who could be the potential bodies and how could the process be whether the industry should come forward because it needs to have a india based tag rather than a state based gi tag so how could we do that so that that's also a work under you know are we we doing on the third part for exports so uh, you know uh, there is lot of discussions on fts going on so my request is whenever you know me or mofpi send any kind of uh, any kind of communication for getting inputs on fts kindly send this to us we along with mofpi are you know discussing with a lot of countries including australia to give uh, you know provincial market access because these countries also ask you know preferential rates to us as well for example for wine australia has asked us so similarly we are trying to get access for indian whiskey as well because right now i think indian whiskey is sold as indian spirit so these kind of issues also we are undertaking bilateral mechanisms also thanks gaurav i think excellent so uh what i'll do now is i'll just sum up some of the key points and then we will open for questions uh, to the forum here uh, first i think the in it's there's no doubt that the indian alcohol industry has evolved uh, from a very uh, mass volume i won't call it commodity we had brands 40 years back also but predominantly price conscious would be the right uh, industry to now a very thriving uh, business where premiumization is happening and happening at a very high uh, pace uh, we uh, are a very we are one of the largest markets for scotch in the world uh, and there's no doubt about it which means you're competing with much more affluent countries like japan uh, the us uh, and 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 so and so forth so we are evolving and we are evolving very fast uh, and i think one of the most important things which has happened and with the advent of i would say transfer of knowledge transfer a lot of technology to limited equipment from the uk the, the scotch spirit which comes in which is blended so brands have become better tasting much better again focusing on a very important thing which shilpa said drink less drink better so it's all about upgrading enjoy the experience and move towards more socially responsible drinking and then that's the word i would use which is correct exports have happened and are happening at a very rapid pace the mix of that exports has changed dramatically it's leaning towards higher value products and not just price level product into the indian diaspora in the middle east and africa however if we want to build the make in india brand we need to create a ecosystem wherein we focus on improving the ease of doing business as i said right at the beginning and i think everybody is alluded to it i can be only strong as my domestic business is and in my domestic business as she said quite vehemently i was skirting it 
we haven't got price increases in market for the last five years. Okay, that's the pain which the industry is talking about. Now, you have that on one side, and the state then goes to the US and the UK and says, invest in my state. It's a big contradiction. And I think that's where Invest India, UK, IBC need to help us. Uh, but I think we are a very vibrant society. Um, India is a very vibrant society. We as a country can produce quality products. Automobiles is a very good example. Uh, services, we have been producing some of the best delivery systems possible. So it's good for us. We need to set things in motion. We need to work together. I think very important thing, Gaurav, and I'm very happy that you are here because uh, I think there's a lot of areas we can work together in a very collaborative manner, which is good for the country and good for everyone in the system. So to the panel, thank you very much for a lovely discussion. And I'm sure we are now going to have lots of questions from the audience. Please. Any questions? Thank you. It's not really a question, it's, um, it's a remark. Um, I've been in India since 10 years, so a GST was implemented when I was here. Um, so all these discussions, what, what you're talking about is not new to me. But I'm actually, I was for 16 years a customs and excise um, commissioner. I'm from Belgium, the beer country. So when I see on how the states here look at um, excises, it's always from an angle like people will cheat. When you look how we do that now, this of course also evolved um, in our country. It's also with checks, but you don't need all these uh, authorizations. This is much less complicated. And when you look at Europe, this is also, uh, when you look from a customs point of view, this is one territory, but when you look from an excise point of view, that is the same like in India, they're the different uh, member states, like you have your states, we have our countries, and still it works because we have some, um, we have some systems, electronic systems, where you can uh, send your goods from one country to the other, and then when you want to export, you can just export. And then when you look at invest, um, we have, uh, you said you were from, uh, you worked for Sub Miller uh, before. So we have uh, AB InBev who's very active here. But what I feel bad about, people invest and suddenly you can get up in the morning and your country, uh, your state where you invested can become a dry state. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, <laughs> yeah, I'm here 10 years, so perhaps I'm a bit too blunt after all these <laughs> years. <laughs> but. It's really very difficult, actually. Uh, I understand make in India, it's very important also for the country, but first of all, you have to export. That is actually what happened with Bira. They bought from a Belgian brewery their beer and then they started uh, brewing here. But it's very difficult to mot motivate people and especially in the alcoholic beverages to invest here because there are so many things you're not certain about. That's what I wanted to share. Thank, thank you, thank you very much. I think you've summed it up well. You know, a lot of us in this industry are veterans in the industry. And I think the only thing that keeps us going and paying us mega bucks is the fact that we've got a crisis every day. <laughs> so so, so it, what you say is almost like adrenaline to us. Uh, but jokes apart, just to... Um, help you out and I think yes uh, you're right you could wake up one day and find that a state for whatever reason has decided to have prohibition but there's always good news at the end of it and uh, I wouldn't be surprised in in the coming months if you find Bihar which had gone dry eight ten eight years, years back eight years. eight years back is people have started talking about opening up. In their poll manifesto, which is extremely interesting, 
normally to get votes you will say i will not do it but they are saying listen we are struggling we are dying because of spurious alcohol the risk to the social structure the health system ecosystem is huge the cost is huge so we should get alcohol in similarly in the northeast we also having talks about a few of the northeastern states also opening up <coughs> so there's a silver lining but we need to understand india is a state of flux it keeps on evolving and going forward so it's not as bad as you know as shocking as what you said what it could have been 10 15 years back but it's good it's it's good in a positive way it's moving forward uh, and i think social mores are changing once the political masters realize that destinies are going to be driven by young india the change will be much more rapid and to very large extent they are going to play a force in the next 10 years india's population is going to become younger and younger the vote mass will become bigger so yes i hope i have made you feel a little better <laughs> you can have a drink in peace <laughs> I think to the second question, I'll first answer. Uh, see, while you said regulatory challenges are accepted, but the scale issue is basically because of the regulations. You know, you cannot uh, operate in this industry as a small scale. Very simple. But having said that, uh, startups are happening in the industry. In fact, uh, I think in the last two years, this industry has seen more than 80 startups. Uh, I mean, which is a huge number over the last ten years, uh, and uh, like Shilpa said, partnerships are required. So, so definitely, you know, Diageo uh, has been working with with a lot of such people. We are we are we are setting up Ponda uh, in Goa. We are setting up uh, a good craft company where we are going to we're, we're going to have a micro distillery. We're going to have a micro brewery. We're going to have a bottling line with these kind of small scale. venturous startups can come utilize the infrastructure and create brands and sell it because because i think the scope is tremendous sir spoke about startups and and i think uh, the startup scopes in in in, in the alcohol sector is huge and and like uh, sanjeet said the young india has to bring in the change so so i am very optimistic that the startup environment as it grows stronger and stronger in the alcohol will also foster the change to the regulatory environment i'll just i'll just complete what sanjeev said so there is no contradiction honestly uh, the idea is uh, that this is a difficult regulatory uh, environment that we all operate in uh, if there is i mean an acceptance to consider us as manufacturing first of all we are an industry who's manufacturing the product happens to be alcohol so give us at least equal opportunity equal incentives equal recognition to be manufacturing 
only then the investments will start coming in only then the startups can have a longer run and not a valuation game so i think yeah. i thank you thank, thank you shilpa just to uh, help you understand ma'am um, i'll talk about few startup stories which have become pretty significant uh, uh, bira is essentially a very successful startup uh, it's a very large company but it started off as a craft brew and she talked about bira brewed in belgium imported in brilliantly marketed innovated they were the first innovators in the beer space they bought us beer in different flavors formats etc so and that ankur is a young entrepreneur no he's quite old quite old now but when he did this he was hardly in his early 30s you know he started so that's one stranger and sons craft chain is another success story you got people now going into artisan rums you got micro breweries you got the goa brewing company which produces a brand called people yeah, which i had in goa for the first time so there's a lot of enthusiasm and it's being led by young india and i think everyone here will agree they are going to drive the change there will be a time when it will come that governments have to realize that they are the largest vote bank <laughs> and then you will see the world change okay uh, any more questions please yes please apart from the vote bank i would say we start nurturing this fact that this is an industry that the chilpas point ahead that the equal recognition respect mutual because an innovation we talk about innovation but how is it different from other industry it's similar Absolutely. like we do in pharma like we do in food and beverages that's how we do in alcohol also it's not a taboo anymore absolutely if we go to scotland everyone is proud of their heritage mm. but here if we talk about we always talk about whispering in all these things although the times are changing but this fact everyone has to from top to bottom or from bottom up it has to be inculcated that yes we all are equal and we are also part of this society and this industry this industry is one of the biggest revenue generator for the states for the government of india and if we are having so many things from it then we should give it back also and it's all about experience it's all about new things that people want to try so let's respect them also so this is a common thought process should start building up absolutely thank you i think you put it very succinctly um as i i think mentioned somewhere in between unfortunately we are not seen as a industry to start with point number 1 and again you know gara we need to start working on that i don't think the alcohol industry wants money let's be very clear they just want that all the <coughs> shackles which are there in our industry it's literally you know if i were to be a script writer i'll say unshackle the shackles that's it the moment you do that investment will come in india is a wonderful destination for indigenous product innovation etc will come in so so i think we've had a wonderful discussion um, and i'd like to thank everyone here you know everybody has been honest blunt uh brutal so i think all of those are extremely good for a discussion you know we didn't skirt around any issues so thank you very much uh, for your time and god bless thanks